off the 31st and final meeting of the New York State Climate Action Council. Today in person, Climate Action Council members will be participating in the meeting here in Albany, and the public is able to view the meeting there, as well as via webinar to enable broader access to the meeting across the state. And as approved by the Climate Action Council at a previous meeting, there is an option for virtual participation for members with extraordinary circumstances who could not join in person. I will now hand it to Jenny Cox from Cadmus to walk us through the procedures for today's meeting before we dive into the agenda. Thank you, Co-Chair Harris. Uh, so that we have another smooth and productive meeting, I'm just reminding the council members on site and virtually of our logistics and procedures for today's meeting. We will ask the location to remain on mute if no one is speaking so we can limit any background noise. We will also monitor the location to ensure that they are muted. If a council member would like to speak, they can raise their hand or stand their placard on the end and the, the co-chairs will make note of it. Co-chairs will call on members in the order they raise their hands to control your mic, just press the button. And if it's on, the light on the base will be green. Also for the benefit of the public observing via webinar, we ask that you please state your name before speaking throughout the meeting. And this applies to all speakers at today's meeting. And to improve audio quality, we ask the speakers project their voice towards the microphones in front of them. And finally, as a reminder, members participating remotely must be on video and their first and last name must appear on their video conferencing screen. Thank you and I'll hand it over to Co-Chair Harris. Thank you, Jenny. Um, let's turn to identifying members of the council who are in attendance today. I'll ask the members in Albany to state their names, starting with my co-chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Basil Sagos, DEC Commissioner. Let's start at the end um, with, um, with Hope Knight. Hope, there you are. <laughs> Empire State Development. Peter Iwanowitz. Rory Christian, Public Service Commission. Keisha Santiago Martinez on behalf of Secretary of State Robert Rodriguez. Donna DeCarroll is National Fuel. Richard Ball, Commissioner, New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Dennis Elsenbeck. Ann Reynolds, the Alliance for Clean Energy, New York. Mario Salento, New York State AFL CIO. Roberta Reardon, Commissioner of Labor. Bob Howarth, Cornell University. Raya Salter. Justin Driscoll, NIPA. Tom Falcone, LIPA. Gavin Donahue, Independent Power Producers of New York. That work. I'll talk loudly. Oh, Paul Shepson. Representing Commissioner Bassett from New York State DOH, Gary Ginsburg. Thank you, everyone. I note we have a quorum for the meeting. And now that we have established a quorum, I will ask the members participating virtually to please state their names. Is anyone per participating virtually? Right. I will assume that no one is participating virtually as of now. If anyone joins, I will um, acknowledge them um, in in time. Um, I do want to note uh, for the uh, purposes of the um, attendance, I see Rose Harvey has joined us. Hello, Rose. If we can turn to the next slide, please. Thank you. Following the initial housekeeping portion of the meeting where prior meeting minutes are voted on and recent announcements are highlighted, we will have a brief overview of major changes to the scoping plan. This will focus on the definition of hydrogen and general feedback on the executive summary, but will not attempt to get into every detailed edit that you received. Directly following that discussion on the changes, we will move to a vote. 
And following the vote, we will move into member statements before wrapping the meeting with brief next steps, which will include recognition of each member of the council and a group photo. Thank you, Doreen. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's proceed with the consideration of the minutes from the last two meetings, starting with the minutes from our second November meeting. Council members all received the minutes. Is there any discussion on that? Okay, I will ask for a motion to approve the minutes. A motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. The ayes have it. Minutes are approved. Next, on to the meeting, to the minutes from the last meeting. Again, uh, you all received that. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, seeing none, I have a motion to approve. Again, Richard, thank you. Second. Second. Roberta, thank you. Uh, all approved? Anyone opposed? They could, no? Thank you. Excellent. Um, next slide, please. So this is the final time that Dorian and I have a chance to go through recent remarks and reflections. Um, next slide, please. Starting uh, last Thursday, Governor Hochul announced the launch of the first in the nation green procurement program to recognize local governments that commit to buying sustainable products. And uh, this, is a, this is a fantastic program that helps to promote leadership at the local level and builds on our nationwide uh, nation leading green procurement program. Um, also, late last week, DEC announced the finalization of two policies, Commission's Policy 49 and Division of Air Resources Policy 21. Uh, CP 49 provides general direction to DEC staff regarding the incorporation of climate change considerations into all agency activities. And uh, DAR 21 provides additional detail for analyses developed under Section 7.2. So both those are very important policies that underpin our approach to CLCPA Section 7.2. Thank you. And late last week, Governor Hochul announced $23 million in funding and awards for transportation electrification initiatives, including fast chargers in Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, including in underserved communities. Awards to ChargePoint and EV Gateway to improve access to upstate New York, and funding for the New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program to support electric school buses. Also last week, Governor Hochul announced a dozen new electric vehicle fast charging stations along the primary travel corridor from the southern tier to western New York. This addition of fast chargers is helping to ensure accessibility of EVs in all areas of the state with more convenient charging opportunities. The governor also recently announced $52 million in awards for 12 regional clean energy hubs to connect communities with clean energy resources through outreach, awareness, and education. The hubs will also help to ensure disadvantaged communities benefit from New York's clean energy transition. Earlier this month, DC announced awards of over half a million dollars to local municipalities for zero emission vehicles as part of, uh, part of our muni municipal zero emissions rebate program. These vehicles in our communities across the state will help New York achieve our greenhouse gas emission targets. Thank you. And I want to note uh, Secretary of State Rodriguez has joined us. Hello. Next slide, please. Let's now move into our summary of changes to the scoping plan following our last meeting two weeks ago. We are not here to debate any additional changes, but if there are questions on the draft final scoping plan, we will take them. Next slide, please. The latest red line document you received incorporated feedback received at our last meeting and member feedback on the executive summary. A clean version of this draft final scoping plan has also been posted to the Climate Act website under the materials for this meeting. Just for your um, awareness uh, for the public listening in. For the benefit of the public, we wanted to spend a few minutes sharing the information related to the changes to the draft plan that occurred between the meetings. One of the outstanding items from our discussion at that last meeting was related to clarifying the definition of hydrogen, 
and how the term is used within the scoping plan. We landed with the following language, which is on page 31 of the draft final scoping plan and page 43 of the PDF file. And I'll read that text now. This scoping plan recommends following technological and research developments on the use of hydrogen as a tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The scoping plan recommends the use of green hydrogen, but acknowledges that in the sector strategies, references to green hydrogen can also include pink hydrogen. Green hydrogen, hydrogen formed by splitting water through electrical processes supplied by renewable energy with a preference given to creation when there is surplus renewable generation, i.e. wind from wind at night. Pink hydrogen, hydrogen formed by splitting water through thermal and or electrical processes supplied by nuclear energy. Future versions of this scoping plan will consider technology and market advancements when evaluating the production and use of hydrogen towards the achievement of the Climate Act emissions limits. In addition, the references throughout the scoping plan that read green and low carbon intensity hydrogen were adjusted to green hydrogen throughout. Next slide, please. Also, since the last meeting, we provided council members with a draft of the executive summary for their review and received some additional editorial feedback. Feedback was received from several members on that draft, so we want to highlight the feedback here. First, there were several members that suggested we could better emphasize the sense of urgency that is needed to address climate change. We incorporated language from the rest of the plan to do this. There was also a call for additional context around some of the transformation to better illustrate the level of change that is required. Clarifying detail, including dates, were added to the summary of zero emission codes and standards in the buildings chapter. Revisions were made to reflect the references to worker and job protections that are included in the rest of the plan. Edits were also made in several areas to indicate the commitment to a just transition. Text was added to reflect the limited use of offsets described in the economy-wide chapter. Concern was expressed that the key principles from the gas system transition plan framework as they were presented could be unclear to readers. To remedy this, we replaced the list of key principles from the table in the main text with a narrative on core concepts to, to summarize the GST framework portion of that chapter. Finally, in the next steps section of the executive summary, we broadened it to include actions beyond the requirements written into the act. There's also some good feedback that was better suited to the main text, so we made those there. And uh, there were any clarifying questions from the council members on, this, on these uh, or other changes uh, that were discussed in the December 5th meeting? Questions? I'll note while you prepare your questions that Ruth Ann is on virtually. Welcome, Ruth Ann. Thanks. Okay, if there's no questions on slide nine, we'll move to slide 10. And with that. Okay, well, as we mentioned, I want to note, um, it does seem that Marie Therese Dominguez, Commissioner Dominguez has, has joined us. Um, let's just pause for a moment to see if she's able to speak as well. Commissioner. I'll try one more time. Commissioner Dominguez, are you on? Okay. As our next step is moving to the vote, I'm just taking a minute to see if um, Commissioner Dominguez can join us. I apologize for the delay. It's only been three years, folks. What's another minute?
forth that are worth counting. Okay, I see Carolyn Ryan is here with Commissioner Dominguez on her cell phone. Yes. Very good. Hi, Commissioner. Hi, good afternoon. This is Marie Therese Dominguez at uh, New York State DOT, Commissioner. Um, I vote yes in favor of the scoping plan. <laughs> Well, we know Commissioner Dominguez's vote, but uh, let's uh, follow through with the uh, resolution. So, as we mentioned at the last meeting, the vote requires a supermajority of at least 15 members to approve and adopt the scoping plan. The vote will be separate from member statements. Valerie Milanovic will call each member by name asking for their vote and that they indicate whether they have a statement they would like to make. The order of roll call will be the co-chairs followed by the remaining members in alphabetical order by last name. If you would like to make a statement following the vote's conclusion, please make that known as well. Following the vote itself, we will turn to member statements and Val will loop back through the roll calling on each member that indicated they'd like to make a statement. You all received a copy of resolution number six in your meeting materials. It reads as follows. Resolution six, resolved that the members of the New York State Climate Action Council hereby approve the final scoping plan as presented at its December 19th, 2022 meeting, together with any changes necessary to reflect considerations discussed at said meeting and any additional non-substantive editorial or grammatical changes deemed necessary for clarity or accuracy prior to submission to the governor, the speaker of the assembly, and the temporary president of the Senate and publication on the Climate Action Council website pursuant to the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. May I have a motion to approve the resolution? And do I have a second? Thank you. Given that our bylaws require an affirmative vote of at least 15 members of the council to approve this resolution, I will now ask Climate Action Council Secretary Valerie Milanovic to call each member by name to ask for your vote. When you hear an name called, please signify that you either approve of the resolution by saying aye or you disapprove by saying no. Val. Thank you, Co-Chair Harris. This is exciting, here we go. Co-Chair Harris. Aye. And I have a statement. <laughs> Co-Chair Sagos. Aye, and I have a statement. Commissioner Ball. Aye, I also have a statement. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, Gary Ginsburg. I and as well a statement. Chair Christian. I and I have a statement. Mario Salento. I and I have a statement. Donna DeCarolis. No, and I have a statement. Commissioner Dominguez. Gavin Donahue. No, and I have a statement. CEO Driscoll. I, and I have a statement. Dennis Elsenbeck. No, and I have a statement. CEO Falcone. I, and I have a statement. Rose Harvey. Aye, and I have a statement. Dr. Howarth. 
I, and I have a statement. Peter Iwanowicz. I, and I do have a statement. President Knight. I, and I have a statement. Commissioner Reardon. I, and I have a statement. Ann Reynolds. I, and I also have a statement. Secretary Rodriguez. I, and I have a statement. Raya Salter. I, and I also have a statement. Dr. Shepson. I, and I have a statement. Commissioner Visnauskas. I, and I also have a statement. By a vote of 19 to, sorry, math, three, <laughs> the resolution is adopted. We have an approved scoping plan. Okay, we're gonna go through the roll again. Congratulations, everyone. And uh, members will be able to make their statements. So we'll go in the same order. Co-Chair Harris. Thank you. My vote is to enthusiastically approve this Climate Action Council final scoping plan. The plan as presented to the council upholds three main principles of the work that we have advanced throughout this almost three year process. Principle one, climate action. This plan demonstrates that climate action is not only necessary, but that delay is to be avoided. Delaying climate action has been shown to cost New Yorkers more. Therefore, I am in favor of undertaking this action now so we can begin delivering additional benefits to the New Yorkers we are acting on behalf of. As we implement our climate actions, certainly we will consider the on the ground issues and immediate costs and concerns of citizens and businesses. This is how we implement policy in the state of New York every day and will continue to do so. But our eye is on the prize and we in New York are wise to take climate action and have it serve as a model for the rest of the country. Principle two, climate justice. We have a plan that demonstrates how success can only be claimed when we have been able to advance and implement our climate action in a manner that addresses the issues of past decisions. Historically, underserved communities have not been included in the dialogue, and that must change. Underserved communities have also not had sufficient access to clean energy in housing, education, and career opportunities, and that must also change. This plan is demonstrating how all disciplines around this table, energy, environment, education, transportation, labor, health, housing, industry, agriculture, have responsibilities to make sure that justice is an equal outcome to the changes in our day in, day out business models. To put it simply, business as usual is no longer an option. Principle three, climate economy. I do agree with comments made at previous meetings that the economic opportunities we are looking to create through our climate planning have often been an unspoken undercurrent in this process. We simply do not succeed if our state economy is not better off for our activities in advancing this plan. I am beyond enthusiastic about the new industries and career opportunities that we are creating in New York. And as a product of upstate New York myself, I have never seen the level of opportunity that is at our doorstep in all parts of our state. But that is not to discount the attention that must be paid to New Yorkers, particularly my energy colleagues and workers that will need to find their new opportunities in our decarbonizing economy. I pledge that I will do what I can to make sure we create all those opportunities and more so that you too can become part of the more than 200,000 jobs we stand to gain. 
I must note that I am not blindly optimistic about this undertaking and what it will take to achieve our goals. I admit that even my eyes were opened when I saw the first output of the integration analysis and better understood the nature of the challenges facing not only New York, but the entire country, if not the world. My own personal takeaway from this planning process has been to better understand that this is not about advancing a few new programs to achieve the goals of the Climate Act. We will truly need to advance transformative, cross-cutting new initiatives to work to the scale of activity that the Climate Act requires of us. Even as we look to potential options for transitional activity under any scenario, we must move to definitive outcomes, and I feel this plan starts us on that pathway. And we must be especially focused in the near term on the challenges associated with this mid-transition period when resources and solutions are ramping up to their ultimate scale. While we always prefer to focus on what is happening within our New York borders, we must realize we are taking on global environmental challenges, looking to influence international consumer markets, creating education and career opportunities for hundreds of thousands of people so they can provide for their families and actively participate in their communities. So I hear many statements that the world is looking at us. I want to make sure that in addition to this priority, the world is coming along with us. So as we look to our own state programs, I will be making sure that the value we're looking to provide to New Yorkers comes with the value that New Yorkers will depend upon from our colleagues at the federal government, our colleagues in state government, our industry and community partners. My vote for this plan is about making sure that we make measurable progress to achieve our state principles. Our actions will launch new innovations in markets and technologies, some of which we do not yet understand how they will be integrated into our thinking. And that should be our emphasis here. We are progressing and we will be learning. And we will put that learning to the test in the next generation of our planning process. So I must conclude my statement with sincere words of thanks. Thank you to my Climate Action Council co-chair, Commissioner Segos, and our 20 council colleagues for working through this multi-year process and for your insights and guidance. And a special thank you to the Climate Action Council's Executive Director, Sarah Osgood, for expertly navigating and leading this effort throughout. And thank you to the army of state colleagues that are engaged in the fight to navigate, to mitigate the impact of emissions and adapt to a changing environment. Your efforts do not go unnoticed and the citizens of New York are ever more aware of your professional expertise, your commitment to the public service and to the sacrifices you have made to make New York a better place. And finally, Thank you to the tens of thousands of New Yorkers who participated in myriad ways throughout this process. Your comments, letters, and engagement have absolutely impacted this process and the plan it has produced for the better. And if there is ever a place that is going to lead the way on solving climate change, it is New York. I am certain of it. Thank you, Co-Chair Harris. Co-Chair Sagos? Thank you. Um, I'll submit written comments. Just want to say a few words, um, starting with my sincere thanks to Doreen Harris, who has been uh, not just a great leader of NYSERDA, but a great friend over these three years as we've embarked upon this incredible journey with, uh, with all of you. Uh, she's a terrific leader uh, and a national leader at that. So Doreen, thank you for all you've done for New York. Uh, to my uh, fellow CAC members, all of you, uh, as well as Sarah Osgood and team and all the staff, uh, who've been a part of this incredible journey. Uh, the 100 plus members of the advisory panels, Climate Justice Working Group, Just Transition Working Group, uh, the, the 300 uh, staff within our agencies, all of whom have been toiling for years uh, to produce this incredible document and the work that we've been discussing now over the course of the last two and a half years. Uh, my thanks also to the public, 35,000 people uh, took the time to speak and write about this climate action plan. Uh, a thousand people showed up to testify at our 11 hearings. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten this far, frankly, without them. And I also want to send some thanks as well to Senator Todd Kaminsky and uh, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright, 
and the members of the legislature uh, for passing the law. And uh, frankly, the thousands of advocates, uh, climate justice leaders, ordinary New Yorkers, businesses who demanded action. We saw the crisis and wanted New York to step up and stand up, and they did so. Lastly, uh, to thank Governor Hochul, who has been done nothing but give us extraordinary support in the cabinet for advancing climate issues. And she's a great reason why we're here today. So in my view today, we're making history. Uh, the CLCPA, as you know, is, is big, it's bold, it's visionary. It was hailed as the most ambitious climate law in the country. And I would say to you today that the final scoping plan is big, it's bold, and it's visionary. It's the most comprehensive document for any state as it charts a path forward on addressing the climate crisis. It puts us on a path to net zero by 2050. This meets our greenhouse gas emission requirements and electrifies our state, reduces air pollution, creating healthier communities, and will literally save lives. It secures justice for communities that have borne the brunt of pollution for decades. It protects and expands jobs, including good paying union jobs, and puts New York in the forefront of, of this extraordinary clean energy economy that's booming around the country and around the world. This is a monumental achievement. You should all be proud. Um, the process, I think you will all agree, hasn't always been easy or hasn't always been perfect, right? You drove many miles, transited many miles. You spent an ex extraordinary amount of time reading, debating. Uh, you showed extraordinary patience along the way. Now, we didn't always agree, uh, including up to the very last second of this in the vote, uh, but I, I am so proud of the civility and the respect that we showed one another. Uh, we all came with our own values and expertise and opinions, and we did as best as we could to merge those values and those opinions into the final product. And to, uh, to my fellow commissioners, uh, I don't think we've ever been closer as a, as a state as a result of the work over the last three years. All the time we spent and our staffs have spent working on this issue for the past three years has brought New York better together. And I think that will pay dividends for years to come. So uh, this is not the end, unfortunately. Uh, we have an extraordinary amount of work ahead of us in 2023 and beyond uh, as we move to adopt the regulations that are envisioned by this plan. Uh, our work with the legislature, of course, will continue. And uh, as Doreen has noted, uh, we have an amazing amount of projects under development right, uh, development right now, but we have very thorny issues, of course, to discuss and to work through and to ch a chart a path forward upon reliability, affordability, equity, uh, transitioning our workforce, uh, aligning our efforts with other states and the federal government, uh, engaging the public, right, something we've talked about quite a bit, and of course, attracting businesses to New York to take advantage of this new economy. So uh, just as this isn't the end, it's also uh, not the beginning. Uh, under, under the governor, we have made extraordinary progress on, on renewable energy, right? wind, solar. Uh, we've done extraordinary work on transmission, and we're doing important work right now on equity. So um, of course, we know this. The climate crisis isn't going away, um, and while we can acknowledge the extraordinary challenges that we have in front of us. I did say, I think in the first meeting that three years ago, that this would be the hardest thing that we ever undertook. And it wasn't the plan that would be hard. It was gonna be the work that was gonna be hard after the plan. Um, but we have uh, reason for optimism now. Uh, we have unique alignment in government, first time ever, federal, state, state of New York, Many other states through the U.S. Climate Alliance, 24 other states also taking actions, and of course at the local level, with hundreds of municipalities here in New York also wanting to step up and take action. We have technologies now that we didn't have 10, 15 years ago, five years ago. Uh, we have businesses, right, that are looking to plant flag in the ground and create jobs based on this economy, and they're doing so already. And of course the private investment behind that. We have a legally binding pathway now for disadvantaged communities. And that will help us address those disparities that these disadvantaged communities have felt for de de decades, if not generations. 
Uh, we have commitments to organized labor. We have organized labor now part of the Climate Action Council. And with all that, all that remains is, is our need to find the will to see this through, to fulfill the promises of the law, to fulfill the work that you all have been doing and take advantage of this incredible opportunity. So I don't say this lightly. I think this will, will be one of the most consequential actions that we have ever undertaken uh, as a state and certainly professionally that any of us has ever undertaken. So on behalf of my three girls, I thank you for your work. Thank you, Commissioner Sagos, Co-Chair Sagos. Commissioner Ball. Great comments. Uh, a special thanks to our co-chairs. I think we all appreciate your dedication to this topic and your leadership. So thank you. In 2020, we set to work with a pretty big task in front of us to come up with the scoping plan that we have before us today. I'm excited about the role that agriculture and forestry will play in the work ahead. Um, but I want to add my thanks also to the members of this council, the advisory panels, all the subcommittees and all the people who sit behind us today that did all the technical work for us. For me, it's particularly exciting to see the final agricultural forestry and land use chapters of this plan. Stakeholders from farm groups, farmers to foresters, conservationists, academics and environmentalists came together and we found consensus in our chapter on a path to help meet the targets set in the CLCPA, while at the same time recognizing the unique challenges that are faced by agriculture and forestry industries, as well as the unique contributions that they offer us. The incentive-based approach set forth by the Ag and Forestry chapter will support farmers and foresters as we work to fill gaps in research to improve climate smart practices that all producers can adopt on their operations, whether they be big or small, organic or conventional, vegetable, row crop, or dairy. And in both our agriculture and forestry sectors, I look forward to working with all of you as we implement this plan and continue on New York's path towards a greener future. This is not the end of anything. This is the beginning of things. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ball. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, Gary Ginsburg. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's an honor to represent New York State Department of Health on this council and to work under the leadership of our dedicated council co chairs as we craft, crafted an exciting and workable vision of a more climate resilient future in New York. The tremendous public response to last year's draft plan has been heartening and it demonstrates the importance of climate change in the minds of all New Yorkers. It is clear from these comments that New Yorkers have a strong desire to prevent the public health impacts of climate change and the public supports the scoping plan approach to accomplishing this. Through the concentrated efforts of the council subgroups, such as the alternative fuel subgroup, as well as climate justice working group, we have been able to create a plan that embraces multiple points of view and strives to reduce New York's health disparities. Climate change has been described by the World Health Organization as the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Our health department approves the scoping plan uh, as it provides a path forward to reduce these direct health impacts. The scoping plan blueprint for action will yield air pollution reductions and health benefits that are in line with the Department of Health's prevention agenda and New York's health in all policies initiative. The time is now to move forward with this ambitious scoping plan and work on implementing its recommendations. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, I strongly endorse and our department strongly endorses and votes to release the final scoping plan. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Chair Christian. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, before I begin, I think it's important uh, to first thank everyone who worked behind the scenes in developing the scoping plan and getting us to where we are today. 
Um, I want to thank staff from NYSERDA, uh, the Department of Public Service, Department of Environmental Conservation, and many other agencies who've worked tirelessly to coordinate meetings, events, and develop and revise the language and the scoping plan. In my mind, they've succeeded in a monumental task of thoroughly embedding in the scoping plan both a clear direction and a set of actions that New York can take to achieve the goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I'd also like to thank the various local governments who provided letters of support or issued proclamations committing their communities to the goals of the Climate, Back, Climate Act, uh, most notably the City of New York, New Rochelle, and Schenectady, among many others. I also want to put out a personal thank you to co-chairs Sagos and Harris for establishing and managing what has been a collaborative and transparent process throughout. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank the individuals and advocate organizations who've engaged in the public comment process and shared their views throughout the many months, throughout the many years developing the scoping plan. Now, with this scoping plan in place, the commission, the Public Service Commission, will be poised to further actions in support of the goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The multiple pathways described in the scoping plan remove all doubt that through electrification and decarbonization, it is possible to make a cleaner, more resilient, and reliable energy system. The scoping plan before us today sets a clear direction while also allowing for sufficient flexibility and approach building in opportunities to revisit the plan and revise our approaches every few years in full recognition that changes in technologies, economic conditions, climate science, and other factors may create new opportunities or challenges and require course adjustments over time. Through the actions outlined in the plan, we'll be able to achieve things that our parents and our grandparents never considered a possibility. A reliable energy system that is cleaner and more resilient but also a system that doesn't unjustly burden certain communities. With the nature of investments to come, combined with their inherent promise of a cleaner future, in my mind, this represents a unique combination of opportunity and hope. The two foundational ideas that drew my family to America and the basis behind our choice to settle in New York. Opportunity and hope are evident throughout the 400 pages of the scoping plan. The jobs created through this effort will, for many, be the beginning of careers that can last a lifetime, providing many with family-sustaining incomes in quality, stable positions. The individuals that will fill these roles, many of which will be good union-paying jobs, will make the goals of the Climate Act a reality. So note today I feel blessed to have had a hand in making this change a reality, and the Department will work diligently to take actions in support of the laws of New York State prioritizing reliability while ensuring each person has the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Christian. Mario Salento. Thank you. Um, first, I, I want to say, Doreen and Basil, I want to thank you both. Um, having come into this process a little later than everyone else, I, I appreciate the help, the assistance you've provided for me and my staff, and, and really the guidance throughout this process, so I do heartily thank both of you. I do appreciate that. Uh, I certainly want to thank my good friend, Roberta Reardon, who's always been a champion for the cause of, of working men and women, so Roberta, thank you as well. And I just, uh, Sarah, Jessica, Jamie, Jane, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, again, uh, everyone has worked with both me and my staff uh, these past six months. It's, it's really been, uh, uh, really, uh, to see the care that you put into this whole process um, and listening to everyone and, and getting everyone's point of view. So thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciate the time and the effort it took um, to ensure that the needs and concerns uh, of, of working men and women were addressed in this document, and I feel they have. Uh, we have um, we've come a long way since May when I first came on to this council, and I think, in my opinion, we've been able to add, to add uh, substantial, uh, significant labor protections and standards, not only for the current workforce, but for generations to come, and I think that's really the key here. Um, and I look forward to working going forward with the governor, who I appreciate for appointing me six months ago. 
uh, working with the governor, working with both houses of the legislature, working with all of the agencies involved, uh, moving to ensure that the labor standards and protections that that we have in this document are, are enacted in statute and, and in um, and in regulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I look forward to meaningful engagement uh, to ensure that portions of this plan that can be enacted unilaterally prioritize working men and women and their unions. And I just want to say to everyone on this on this council, I, I do thank you all for truly understanding and valuing the role uh, that working men and women will be playing in this process for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Donna DeCarolis. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I do have a full statement that I'll provide via email, um, Sarah, to you. Um, I'd like to just hit a few highlights of that. Um, but before I do, I do want to also say thank you to the co-chairs, Sagos and Harris and and uh, and to Sarah Osgood down there. Um, such a highly professional work. Um, and also just, just a, a thank you to everybody and all the state agencies that worked very, very hard, I know, to attempt to reconcile a lot of different viewpoints on things into one final document. So thank you for, for that. And I, it's really been my privilege to be a member of this council and to get to know many of you here um, at, at, this ta at these tables. So um, with that, um, I, I find that uh, the recommendations included in the final plan, of course, will result in sweeping changes that will have a profound impact on all New Yorkers. And while for all of us here, this has been at the top of our mind for the past almost three years, I do still believe that there's a wide um, majority of New Yorkers that aren't all that aware of it. Uh, so I do think that we have some work to do there, and I know we, we all agree on that. Um, I support many of the recommendations in the plan. I'm just going to name a few because I'll go into detail in my, in my more lengthy statement. But one is um, the adoption of more robust um, and uh, accelerated energy efficiency programs is, is sort of a first a no regrets um, way to reduce emissions. Also, the increased emphasis on the development of thermal energy networks by utilities and by others as a, as a really important pathway for the future. Um, we're, we're very excited about that. And then, of course, the evaluation and consideration of the use of the natural gas distribution system to deliver renewable natural gas and hydrogen. And then especially um, the inclusion of a rigorously developed and very thorough um, gas transition framework that was included in Chapter 18. I think that was very good work. And I think that's going to really help guide um, the transformation going forward. Um, even with these positive inclusions, however, I do remain concerned that the scoping plan doesn't go far enough to ensure a responsible energy future for New York consumers. And through my uh, tenure on this council, um, from my perspective as the head of a, of a Western New York utility that serves communities with more than 1.6 million people, tens of thousands of businesses, small and large, um, I have continued to strongly voice the need that the scoping plan fully consider the impacts on consumers for residential homeowners, for businesses, for industry. And I've tried to offer constructive perspectives and alternatives that will allow us to meet the requirements of the CLCPA while preserving reliability, energy system resiliency, and an affordable transition. I find that the plan before us, the final plan, has shortfalls in this regard. And my vote of no is based upon significant concerns that I have in four major areas. And I'll just touch on the four. First, the plan fails to adequately assure grid reliability for consumers. In recent months, the New York ISO has issued increasingly frequent and serious warnings about the grid outlook um, given the state's planned energy transform transformation, saying uh, three months ago in September that, quote, future uncertainty is the only thing certain about the electric power industry, and as recently as just last month, that, quote, thinning reliability margins over the next decade provide increased challenges and that, quote, even the slightest deviations from expected conditions, load forecasts, or project delays could trigger future reliability needs. So the, in my view, the plan's undue reliance on electrification to achieve the state's emissions reduction goals may push the state and consumers squarely into the sort of reliability shortfalls that we've seen in other states and that the New York ISO has repeatedly warned about. Uh, second, the plan relies too heavily on a single energy source prone to weather-related disruptions. Even with the significant reliability and resiliency concerns raised by the NISO and others, the plan still does include essentially an electrify virtually everything approach, mandating dates for the electrification of heat beginning as soon as 2025 for new residential construction, and in 2030, just seven years, in just seven years for existing buildings. 
This places an undue risk on consumers by requiring that they rely so heavily on a single form of energy and a single energy delivery system, especially one that is prone to disruption by extreme weather events. Mandating the electrification of heat without the assurance of electric system readiness, in my view, is inherently risky and simply unacceptable for consumers. Third, the plan does not include a full assessment of impacts on consumer energy affordability. A thorough quantitative analysis of all costs associated with the emissions reduction initiatives identified in the scoping plan should be performed and shared with the public, including annual and total cost impact on electric and natural gas bills for all customer sectors across the state, assessment of retrofit and conversion costs for consumers to electrify everything in their home, in their home and visibility on projections for the cost per kilowatt hour of electric grid and local transmission and distribution build out. This long overdue analysis is critical to an understanding of cost impacts for New York's residents. And then fourth, the plan fails to utilize the extensive existing natural gas delivery system for decarbonization. I know a, a topic of quite a lot of debate. In my view, consumers should be given the option of a dual or hybrid heating system using existing gas delivery infrastructure, especially in upstate and western New York, where the climate is significantly colder and the grid build-out requirements for winter heating needs would be most extensive. Consistent with their treatment in other jurisdiction, ju jurisdictions, the value of alternative fuels as a decarbonization tool should be recognized and incentivized, especially renewable natural gas, which can offer significant near-term emissions reduction benefits. This all options approach will better manage the affordability and feasibility risks of the state's plan. So in summary, in my view, if pursuit is written, there's an unfortunate possibility that consumers could end up paying more for less reliable energy. And these concerns are magnified for a region like Western New York, where it is 45% colder than downstate. 94% of the energy used on a cold winter day is provided by natural gas, and nearly 90% of the Western New York region heats with natural gas. So in closing, these are the concerns uh, that, that were top of mind for me and were raised in the thousands of comments received on the draft scoping plan. I don't believe they have been adequately addressed in the final document. And as a result of these shortfalls and because I believe there's a more complete set of options that the scoping plan does not fully consider and include, this is the reason for my vote um, of no. So thank you very much. Pass the mic. Thank you, Donna. Commissioner Dominguez. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for indulging me to <laughs> have a little audio at the beginning. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank our, our co-chairs. Uh, President Harris and Commissioner Sagos, you've been uh, at this from the very beginning. I remember the very first meeting, um, although it feels like yesterday, there was, a, there was indeed a, um, a period of time here, even during COVID, when we were uh, making progress exponentially, I think, as we move forward. And I think a lot of the fact, the fact that we actually have kept our timetable has a lot to do with your fortitude um, and uh, ability to actually pull people together in a really timely way, but also to allow us to work and keep going, never stopping uh, to meet this goal, even in the face of a pandemic. So, um, just like we kept uh, the transportation system going, uh, we, uh, we also kept this very important effort going to meet our climate goals under the CLCPA. So, thank you very much for your leadership. And thank you to Governor Hochul for really making that uh, possible for certainly for the state agencies to, to do that. Um, I want to take the opportunity to really commend the dedication, the expertise, and the contribution of the members of, uh, I'll start with the advisory panels that worked uh, with transportation in particular and our working groups. Um, we were able to pull together a diverse representation, I think, um, of membership for our advisory panels and it really put us in good stead, I think, to advance the principles that we have uh, come to capture here in the scoping plan. And each of my partner council members for your efforts, I want to thank you uh, to develop this plan um, really on behalf of the people of the state of New York. Your work is recognized. It's appreciated along with the efforts of the agency and the consultant staff. I have to tell you, um, the agency staff, as Donna was just referencing, um, 
it's deep and it's wide and people have done an enormous amount of work. And uh, I just want to thank them, not just from the transportation team, but so many diverse agencies, most of which are sitting around the table, but there are a lot that are represented in other forms. So I just want to say uh, a big thank you. Um, it really has been a monumental team effort across the board. Um, we're all united behind a shared vision for a greener, a cleaner, and a more equitable future, not just for New York, but for our nation. And with this plan, New York is truly charting a course to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve a carbon neutral future. We're also laying a solid foundation to encourage new manufacturing and technology while supporting our service related industries and jobs uh, all so that we can achieve these goals. And it's really important. So whether it's in agriculture or any of the other technology areas, uh, that technology is truly driving us forward in so many different ways. These smart, sensible policies and strategies will not only advance economic development and growth, but support historically disadvantaged communities um, to truly enhance equity. At the State Department of Transportation, we are in literally hundreds of communities every day, keeping the roads and bridges and airports and transit systems safe, all of the modes of transportation. And doing that kind of work on these projects, um, many of which are aligned uh, and will continue to be aligned in new and, um, and innovative ways. Uh, we have the opportunity to literally hear from communities across the state of New York every day. What should we be doing? How should we be looking at it? Help us inform us. And the work of the Climate Action Council mirrors uh, our philosophy at DOT, which is really focusing on people and communities and what their needs are and, their shared, and our shared values as New Yorkers because that's the way we actually get things done is by continuing this open and um, process. I recognize that actions within the transportation sector are critical to meeting these uh, nation leading climate goals uh, and DOT as an agency, we value um, what's been put forth and those include the values of sustainability and equity. These really are our uh, our guiding uh, rails here with regard to planning decisions and investment choices and how we move forward with operational priorities. So working with our partners and communities um, across the state of New York, uh, we will be looking to in our partners in labor, uh, acad academia, technology, economic development across the board. We're going to be continuing to build on these strategies and the goals that are outlined in the scoping plan. Um, as they apply to the transportation sector, and that's going to take everybody. It's going to take absolutely everybody, and that's what's incorporated here into this plan today. So it's been my privilege to serve as a member of the council, and um, I want to thank again everybody for contributing, certainly on the transportation side, but across the board. And I want to thank Governor Hochul for her leadership. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this, this generational effort. Thank you, Commissioner. Gavin Donahue. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, like everyone else around this table, I, I appreciate the hard work of all the staff uh, from the commissioners on down. Uh, I had the fortune of being in state government years ago, and, and I know what kind of effort this took. Uh, and I appreciate that. And while I may not agree with all of the outcome in some of the aspects of it, I, I do know that day to day work is hard. Um, these two plus years have allowed me to educate myself better on issues in the energy arena uh, and work with people sometimes I never worked with. Uh, Raya and I may not agree on a lot of things, but we've developed a friendship and a working relationship and hopefully we'll work to improve things in the future. Peter may not want to admit this, but he and I went to college together and known each other forever. I know, I know. Um, but, uh, these issues are compelling and complicated, and I appreciate everybody's perspective that they bring to the table. Um, I represent over three quarters of the generation in New York State. I have all different fuel sources. Uh, the chairman of my board is, is a hydro facility uh, named Brookfield Renewable. Um, I'm proud of the work we've done in New York. 
We have reduced over in the last 25 years in the electricity sector, CO2 over 60%, NOx 90%, SO2 88%. And at the same time, we've made the electricity grid more reliable. And I think it's safe to say New York's grid is the most reliable one in the nation. And not to be redundant to my friend Donna, that's what we're all about here. We're trying to keep this grid reliable, affordable. And what I was looking for in this process is policies and markets outcomes that are gonna help contribute to make the electricity sector the positive force it's been for the last 25 years. And to make that happen, I put together a seven or eight page document that I submitted to most of my council members. I'm gonna to try to summarize some of my issues with this quickly today. Um, reliability, uh, you know, Professor Shepson and I have gone back and forth on the term reliability. I agree 100% with him that reliability is spewn throughout this document. That doesn't mean we have addressed reliability. That just means we've got words in there about reliability. And um, I don't think we've done enough to ensure reliability as we transition from our current system to a vastly larger decarbonized energy system in just short 18 years from now. Um, specifically, the ISO has indicated that we need at least, and I emphasize at least, 111 gigawatts of total install generation by 2040. 95 gigawatts must be new generation. 27 gigawatts must be dispatchable emission-free generation. For those that are not in this space, one gigawatt is 750,000 homes. The build-out that we're talking about here is unbelievable. And this state has never seen a build out like this. So we need to do it right and we need to keep the system reliable. Where I think we've missed an opportunity is I've worked with labor unions and we have a petition pending at the Public Service Commission uh, to have the PSC determine what that DFER, the dispatchable energy resource is that's zero emitting. It's been pending for a year and a half. We've done nothing with that. Um, we have today no idea in 2040, what's going to keep the lights on or what's going to be the fuel to, to fuel that 27 gigawatts of electricity I just talked about to maintain reliability. That to me is a missed opportunity. Um, and, I, and I've said this before, I believe that we probably can make uh, 70 emission, 70 percent reduction by 2030. We need everything to go right, but how we get the next to the next 10 years in 2040, it's complete magic because we don't address it. And the statute calls for us as a council to address that. And we didn't do it in this document, in my estimation. So I'm disappointed in that. Um, you know, Donna talked about all the options on the table. Uh, alternative fuels are very important to me and very important to my members. That's how we run our generating units. Governor Hochul and Senator Schumer, I think, are, are right on the right track. They're working to establish New York as a green hydrogen hub. $10 billion are at stake for research and development in that area. NIPA, I give Justin a lot of credit. NIPA had a demonstration project to blend hydrogen and natural gas. We know what the results were? Reduction in CO2, reduction in NOx, reduction in ammonia. The next one, I have one of my members, it's a little commercial, I guess, Constellation, NYSERDA and Doreen's leadership, $12.5 million grant to develop an electrolysis project with long duration storage at their power plant. So I think, you know, Governor Hochul, Senator Schumer, NIPA and NYSERDA should be commended for their forward thinking. If projects like this materialize, I believe we will be the clean energy hub of the future. Um, we need more innovative solutions in this process. We do not have enough innovative solutions in this scoping plan. And those are the types of projects that are gonna help New York get to a place that I think Mario would like to see on jobs and we would like to see us be more competitive. Um, on energy costs, the costs are going to be high for all New Yorkers. In January of 2021, Donna alluded to this. I worked with Donna and 64 other statewide organizations to ask for a comprehensive ratepayer study on the impact that this plan could have on ratepayers. We sit here today, and that is not part of this plan. So consumers and residents of New York, don't be, you know, don't be fooled. We do not know what the cost of this plan is going to cost. However, at the same time, New Jersey went ahead and did a cost assessment of what this project and their clean energy goals will be, and they estimate it to be $600 billion. So for me, I think it's really important that
that if we're going to ask New Yorkers to pay $25,000 to $50,000 to retrofit their houses to comply with the law, that we have an obligation and we should have done that in this plan. The macro analysis that I know Peter speaks to all the time is important, but that doesn't tell people how they're going to pay their bills. And that to me is, is where we've missed that. Um, I understand the vote's been taken, but at the end of the day, the electricity in this state must keep, keep flowing and be affordable for all the ratepayers. This plan must result in real emission reductions and not increase. And this is what I'm worried about. And I think this is something Dennis talks about, I, not increase the imported emissions. Um, and at the same time, crushing our economy and having more New Yorkers leave. If we just put policies in place that chase companies that I work for and others to other states and subject us to the air emissions, we really have done a disservice from our jobs and an economic, economic standpoint here in New York. Um, the other issue I have with this plan is regulatory uncertainty. Commissioner Sagos knows where I'm coming from on this. Peter and I worked on this together on Section 7 compliance of the CLCPA. We are not regulating this industry, in my judgment, properly through commissioner's policies. We need regulations so that the industry knows 10 years from now, when Commissioner Sagos is not there, who and how we're going to get our permits. We today do not issue Title V permits for energy infrastructure in the state. It is a problem long term for reliability. I know it's not your fault. It's Jared's fault. I blame the retired guy. But the fact of the matter is this regulatory uncertainty about how we issue permits in New York to keep the lights on is really important. Commissioner's policies are not the way to go and are really short sighted. So the other issue that I have, I've harped on in this process, and I give the council credit for mentioning it, but the idea of existing renewables are a huge resource in New York State. We have 2,000 megawatts of existing renewables that are participating in the state, and their REC payments are going out of state. We need to make it more competitive so that those renewable resources stay in New York to help achieve our goals. We don't talk about how to do that. That is expensive. That is important, and it's been around a long time. Um, the other issue that I, I just make me cringe a little bit is we, we jump all the way to bans and moratoriums throughout this plan. We don't try to talk about what technologies can comply with the law. We just say we're going to ban appliances, we're going to ban this, we're going to have a moratorium on that. To me, that just sends just a negative message about New York and its business future. And the last thing that, that, that really has, has bugged me too, and I think Professor Shepson and I will agree on this one, um, we use a lot of undefined terms in this document. The issue of fossil gas, fossil natural gas, however you want to say it, should not be part of this document. I know I sound like a broken record. It's not in law. It's not in regulation. It's a political statement. Um, and I'm disappointed that we continue to use not just that definition. There's other definitions dealing with siting um, and other things that I think should have been better defined in this process. But I do appreciate all the time that everybody around this table put into this. I want to thank my staff who's worked very hard with me. Um, this process is going to be hard. This transition is going to be hard. I know everybody has a different perspective, but for me, those are the reasons why I feel that this plan is not, um, is not living up to what it should have in all the fanfare when it was signed into law in 2019. So thank you for your patience and thank you for listening. Thank you, Kevin. CEO Driscoll. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I, like Mario, have not uh, been with you throughout this entire journey. I joined, I joined the council in October of uh, 2021. Um, this is an important moment in time that I think we all recognize here around this table. And uh, when New York State passed the Climate Act, it led in a very big way nationally. It chose to act. A lot of others were still studying. We chose to act. And now we've created the roadmap to a clean energy future here in New York State that is really a, 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 a perfect example of what government uh, can and should be doing. Um, and now it's so exciting to see the work of this council come to fruition in this plan. I'd like to thank uh, Sarah Osgood and staff for all the great work that you've done. I want to commend the work of the co-chairs, President Harris, Commissioner Sagos, and the members of this council. We've truly done remarkable work here. And I'm excited to think about the role that the New York Power Authority can play in this transition. Look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Justin. Dennis Elsenbeck. Thank you. I'll be submitting written comments uh, much more detailed than I, I want to mention at this juncture. Um, you know, I, I'm deeply committed to helping New York State achieve objectives of the CLCPA. Uh, however, I decided to vote against the scoping plan in its current form as I'm concerned that we have fundamentally missed the mark on balancing environmental economic sustainability. The law's intent must be urgently pursued and achieved. However, there are several critical gaps in the scoping plan that exists today. This is not my first uh, experience in major energy policy initiatives that back in the 80s, uh, we also said was nation leading and, uh, and a concern over national security uh, in New York, as I witnessed the impact of the six cent law that was created in the 80s, reversed in the 90s, with lin lingering impacts well into the mid uh, 2000s. And we have to avoid that, or at least consider that as we go forward. It is one thing to set aggressive timelines and uh, ambitious goals, but you can't lose sight of the fundamentals, such as the readiness of our electric system to handle diverse renewable supply locations and rapidly increasing electric demand. The challenges facing our unique local economies and the untapped capabilities of New York's energy sector, manufacturing, SUNY, and our innovation ecosystems. To combat climate change, bold action is needed, but by focusing on the fundamentals, New York State will find the best path to sustainably achieve the CLCPA goals in a cost-effective and timely manner bringing opportunity to our disadvantaged communities and ensure the state's investments drive a substantial return on our economy and our climate. Economic and supply chain development, which I really was appreciative of staff and the manner in which my comments specifically were captured in the scoping document. But again, it was more about fundamentals. Having major objectives that are achieving climate solutions without deeply penetrating economic and supply chain development to me is the biggest missed opportunity and i do want to commend the the staff and and the entire team uh, for including that within the framework of the document in our ter in terms of our initiative to spend up to 40 percent of the CLCP or the CLCPA within the DAC communities, measurable and accountable metrics are needed and must drive our actions. And quite frankly, we should have had them as uh, as a determinant in how we vote on the on the scoping plan. I'm incredibly proud of the Climate Action Council's collaborative progress over the past two and a half years. My decision and my comments today are intended to build towards a higher probability of achieving deep greenhouse gas reductions while establishing New York as a leader in global climate efforts. Uh, throughout the, the, the discussions, sometimes I felt that we we're more focused on how to shut down the natural gas system than achieving greenhouse gas initiatives. And as a technical person, defining the real problem statement is key in how we proceed and how we uh, solve these issues going forward. A number of staff members from the state were active throughout the process and should be commended. I, I wish I knew the names, uh, although I probably wouldn't have enough time to mention them all. Uh, as for co-chairs Basil and Doreen, the advisory groups, the Climate Justice Working Group, and the Just Transition Working Group, and my fellow council members, I simply offer my humble thanks uh, because this has been an experience uh, that all of us have probably learned from. And as Doreen pointed out in the past interview, and I think it was not that long ago, the scoping plan is not the end, it's actually the start. And, and I believe that to be true. And I also believe that this isn't the end of public comment and inclusion. This is also the beginning of public comment and getting involved. We need to engage the entire 
economy if we are going to make this work. And that's what I mean by balancing environmental and economic sustainability. It has to come together because if it doesn't, both will fail. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. CEO Falcone. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Doreen and Basil for the opportunity to make a statement here. Uh, as you know, I'm Tom Falcone. I'm the CEO of LIPA, the not-for-profit electric utility that serves uh, Long Island and the Rockaways. We serve about a million two customers, about three million people. Uh, the Council's mission was to reduce New York State's carbon footprint, to make our communities more resilient, and to support our economy with well-paying clean energy jobs. It's been my pleasure to serve with each of you over the last 30 months. Uh, in my opinion, the, the scoping plan is impress impressive and a substantial effort towards that mission. Uh, often when I speak to public audiences, their sentiment is that our clean energy transition is something in the future, something that we aspire to. Uh, I have to say, though, we are well on our way. For example, just on Long Island, the carbon emissions of the electric grid with currently planned actions will decline more than 70 percent by 2030. That is right around the corner. And that clean electricity uh, per this plan will serve as the fuel of the future for heating, for transportation, and for the other sectors of the economy. No doubt the scoping plan will require a significant investment in the future, but the clean energy transition will allow New Yorkers to save green while being green. Uh, LIPA, for its part, is helping its customers both save money and save carbon by switching from oil heat to a heat pump where they can cut their fossil fuel emissions and their heating bills 50 percent, or from moving from an internal combustion engine vehicle to an electric vehicle. Those customers will see the savings. Meanwhile, as mentioned here this morning, there are some things that, despite our best efforts, we can't know today, but that will become important to this effort over the coming years. Looking back on decades-long projections are always humbling because many things simply aren't predictable, like the cost and pace of new technology that will be required to achieve our objectives over the next 30 years. The good news is that technological progress often comes faster and cheaper than projected. We have struck the right balance in this scoping plan of adopting actionable recommendations today to guide the state's regulatory agencies while leaving future councils with the decisions to make with better information. If we accomplish all that we've planned over the next five years until the next council adopts a new plan, New Yorkers will have much to be proud of. Finally, I would like to thank our chairs and our staff. They are dedicated public servants of the first order. It's only through their efforts that we've made progress. And I wish all my council members a happy holidays and a happy new year. Thank you, Tom. Rose Harvey. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I, I too want to start and thank the, uh, our fabulous co-chairs and uh, Doreen and Basil, you're amazing. And uh, it was very hard to lead this and you did it uh, very, very well respectfully. And uh, I think the, the result is excellent. And Sarah, uh, you're awesome and everybody, uh, behind you and also uh with respect to this council just the presence of all the other agencies in the room with their leadership and also with their team is unprecedented and one of the biggest issues with government is silo uh the silo effect and we right here in this council uh, we are showing that we're not going to be siloed. And as this whole result has to ripple through all the state and everyone, starting right here with state government, is really a sign uh, that we can do it. And thank you also to all the working groups, all the committees, and everyone, and, and certainly Governor Hochul for uh, giving the support and uh, making this happen because a plan it is as big, as bold as you said, 
Basil, big, bold, and visionary, but a plan is big, bold, and visionary, but only as good as what it accomplishes on the ground if it, too, is big, bold, and visionary. And we often see so many plans with no results. And I believe that this scoping plan has, has started, and it is only a start, uh, to create that balance between the environment and the sustainable and the economic. Um, and I, I want to start, too, with defining principles of disadvantaged communities, because it's, we're not j just making sure that 35 percent with a goal of 40 percent of the spending benefits go to disadvantaged communities, but we also have to make sure that what everybody thought in the past were the solutions of the future were really the pollutions of our health, our environment, of our economy, and our well-being. So um, I really believe we, we are going to uh, honor this defining principle and start right there. Um, but also economic reality, yes, we haven't had uh, perhaps enough studies, but the EEE who did an excellent job, economic integration analysis gives you a good idea that it can be done and that it is economic and it's better to start now than rather than to pause and to wait. And uh, with that, we need enough specificity of goal. We need a roadmap and enough specificity of goals and metrics that are sooner rather than later uh, so that we can see if it works. And also, who knows where we will be in eight years vis-a-vis -vis technology? Who knows where the market will be? Who knows? where the transmission issues are and adjust accordingly. So I don't believe there's a ban on what we already have in place. It's, it's to use the new solutions of the future and but continue to evaluate, continue to change and, and continue to go forward knowing more with time. So uh, I'm uh, I, I think it's amazing that uh, where we got, and uh, I have just great respect for all the council members, particularly um, I mentioned all the government, but all the our citizens council members um, and their expertise, their knowledge, their listening and partnership. And uh, I, I hope with those that have so much experience uh, in the utility business that I, I hope that we will figure out something going forward. Thank you, Rose. Dr. Howard. Thank you. I fully support the scoping plan and I'm honored and proud to be a member of this Climate Action Council. I thank Speaker Carl Hasty and other members of the assembly for this opportunity to have served. And I particularly want to acknowledge assembly person Steve Engelbright, who of course was hugely instrumental in the passage of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. There's so many strong aspects of that, so much wisdom shown in, in drawing uh, this act. And, and uh, Steve was a critical, critical part of that too, many, many years. I, I want to mention one part in particular. Uh, I was able to work with him closely on the part of the act that deals with greenhouse gas uh, accounting. And in the accounting, which is part of the CLCPA, which Steve understood and, and endorsed, uh, a government for the first time ever really is endorsing the strong science that shows that methane emissions and not just carbon dioxide our major contributor to global climate change. The science has gotten even stronger on that since the CLCPA was passed. The latest from the IPCC tells us that more than one third of all of the global climate warming that's occurred since the start of the Industrial Revolution is due to methane. Our state addresses that in a way that no other state, no other government has, has done. 
Further, in passing the CLCPA, New York recognized that our consumption of fossil fuels and not simply geographic boundaries are what matters in addressing the climate crisis. So New York wisely banned the use of high volume hydraulic fracturing to develop shale gas in our state quite some time ago now. But since the time of that ban, the use of fossil natural gas has risen faster in our state than in any other state in the nation. The methane emissions associated from that shale gas, our use of that shale gas are high, but much of these emissions occur outside of the boundaries of our state. They occur in Pennsylvania, in West Virginia, and in Ohio. But under the CLCPA, we take responsibility for those because they wouldn't be occurring if we were not using the gas. The way to reduce these emissions, in my opinion, is to rapidly reduce our use of fossil natural gas and move to the beneficial electrification of heating and of transportation that is key to the scoping plan. In the well over 100 meetings of this council and our advisory panels and the working groups that we've had since March of, of, of 2020, all viewpoints have been respectfully heard and, and debated. And the tone set by our co-chairs, Doreen Harris and, and Basil Sagos, was a critical part of this. I thank them and all of the members of the council for our sense of community through deliberations in which we often had major differences of opinion. I also thank the staff who contributed so much to the development of the scoping plan. We've heard a large number of people participated. I'm sure that's true, but I particularly want to acknowledge Sarah Osgood, Maureen Leddy, Jared Snyder, Carl Moss, and Jessica Waldorf. Although I strongly support our scoping plan, I do have a disappointment or two, and, and chief among these is the decision to postpone the date by which the state will move away from uh, fossil fuel use in new construction. Uh, our draft plan from a year ago called for a ban for new home construction by 2024. I still think that would be the best path forward, and I hope that the Assembly and the Senate will consider that moving forward over this coming year. I provided additional comments in the written statement, which will be appended to the scoping plan. But, but overall, this council and the citizens of New York should be pleased and proud of the scoping plan. It's a strong path forward. It's an excellent step forward in implementing the CLCPA. Our Climate Act and the scoping plan can set an example to the world. I believe it will set an example to the world as we work to address the existential threat of climate disruption. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Peter Iwanowicz. Uh, thank you, Doreen. I appreciate it. Um, and I, too, want to just start off by giving uh, extreme thanks to the co-chairs, uh, Basil and Doreen, all the staff, um, so many of them mentioned here, so many of them are around the room, probably on the, the WebEx link, sort of watching in. Um, you know, many years ago, when several of us in the community started to draft the precursor of the CCPA, uh, that became the climate law, the CLCPA. We fully knew the amount of commitment of the agencies and the agency staff that we're going to get involved in this whole process if we succeeded in getting into law. So apologies for the time and energy that we've taken away from your family and your friends and the, and the investments you all, have, all had to make with us over the last three years. We knew what we were doing when we wrote the bill. We knew what we were doing to pass the law. And I think all of us know what we're doing today uh, by approving this plan and all the hard work that went into it. So a deep, a deep gratitude as a New Yorker and a person on this council for all everybody has done into it. And I also want to just thanks quick shout out. Nobody's done this so far. Let me be the first, the technical staff that have helped guide us through extremely challenging times, uh, presenting in technological formats. So, so many New Yorkers could participate safely and all of us can be beamed across the state, uh, virtually to, to folks who are in line. Technical staff never get a thanks, but the folks behind the computers behind me are making sure this is working well and smoothly. The comments on the plan, when it was passed by the legislature, the New York Times called the CLCPA one of the world's most ambitious climate plans. While a bold pronouncement and attention-grabbing headline, I hope you all agree that by any measure, it's an accurate description of the legislation that was written by those on the front lines of the climate crisis and for those on the front lines of the climate crisis. At the time in 19, uh, 2019, it was a novel approach and a testament to how policy should work. For me, the work of the Climate Council has always been to create a plan that lived up to this billing. I'm honored to have been able to work with you all 
on our recommendations to the people of New York, the governor and the legislature. And like Bob Howarth, I'm grateful that the Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Hastie, appointed me to this council. And also like Bob Howarth, I really just wanted to give a personal shout out to the vision and leadership of the soon to be outgoing legislator, Steve Engelbright. Um, the reason why we sit here today as a council is because of his vision and leadership of moving that through at a time when he didn't have legislative partners in the Senate, but fortunately he got those partners and here we sit today. So for sure, the hard work is still ahead, but our vision lays out the path to success. The CLCPA provided us the promise and through multiple provisions in the law, the guidance to make the right decisions on the pace and the scale of the change needed. At its core, the CLCPA is about establishing standards into law so that New York could do its share to create a planet that is healthy enough for humans to inhabit. That's the simple truth of what we're after here. What we learned through our process is that zeroing out all greenhouse gas emissions through a massive transformation of our economy is really the only viable path. What truly makes the CLCPA the most ambitious of plans is the legal assurance that those disproportionately impacted by climate change and unhealthful air quality will have their needs, their health, and their communities prioritized, and that we will not leave any worker behind as a transition unfolds. What we have developed as a council is a solid blueprint that will guide the public and lawmakers in how to secure the promises of our climate law. The plan shows the pathway forward to provide big benefits, including reduced energy bills, improving our health and lowering health care costs, reversing decades of environmental injustice that has caused such harm to those who live, work, and play in disadvantaged communities. The costs of acting are not trivial, but as our analysis shows, the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of acting. Our plan shows that the quicker the public, the governor, and the legislature move to electrify all sectors, the faster we'll realize the benefits. The prioritization of all electric buildings and zero emission vehicles are a hallmark of the plan's effort to achieve that 40% cut in emissions by 2030, seven years from today. It means that a quarter of all our vehicles in the roads in New York State be zero emissions by 2030. That's not a quarter of new, that's a quarter of all vehicles. This is the level of penetration that has to be hit if we are to achieve that 2030 goal. So I'm particularly happy that the plan is short on the gimmicks and shortcuts that other states and nations have used to address their jurisdiction's role in the climate crisis. In particular, we have honest limits that we see for alternative fuels like biogas and green hydrogen. We have the recognition that offsets as a compliance strategy will have little or no role. And we have the understanding that clean fuel standards and transportation have to be truly clean by focusing on electricity and rejecting the sort of trading schemes that other states have done with other fuels. As we emerge from our planning process and adopt this plan and others pick up the ball and move it further down the field, here are my thoughts on the near-term keys to success. First, we have to stop digging the hole deeper. We no longer have the luxury of leaving all options on the table. Those days have passed. We must assure that all entities of the state are running all their decisions through the analysis required under Section 7.2 and 7.3 of the CLCPA. We must, we must listen to climate justice leaders as the discussion on cap and invest program commences so that the climate plan can be funded, the issues of regressivity are addressed, and safeguards are in place to prevent pollution hotspots and disproportionate impacts. We must secure partnerships with local governments to ensure that implementation of building codes, zoning, and other land use decisions are aligned with the goals of the CLCPA and don't contradict them. We must commit to an extra equitable distribution of state and federal funds so that each New Yorker can benefit. We need to prioritize the vision of communities so that the transition to the new economy is a just and equitable one. And for all of the state agency heads here today, please post this plan in each of your employees' office spaces. 
and set annual performance goals based on achieving this plan. Let me just wrap up with a couple of personal notes of privilege. For anyone working on climate policy and social justice, it is hard not to mix the personal and the professional. The hopes and dreams that we have for future generations and what they need us to do for them today are ever present. My son was born on the very day the Bush Cheney administration pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Climate Accords. That was March 13th, 2001. In the hours after my birth, I held him wondering and actually talking to reporters, how much of his life would it transpire before the US had comprehensive policy to address climate change? Though I cannot answer that question today, I am happy to also mark another child's birthday anniversary. Today is my daughter's 24th birthday. With a vote today, it's another big step away from that climate bis in action. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you these past few years. It was a privilege to travel the state and to hear from so many New Yorkers about their hopes for climate action and their asks for us to address their fears. I think that the final plan is better because we took the time to listen and to work things through together as a council this summer and fall. Thank you for listening to my comments today. Thank you for spending the time and energy to put together this plan together. When fully implemented, the CLCPA will secure all the promises that the law provides. Onward. Thank you, Peter. President Knight. Thank you. Uh, this is an important and exciting moment for New York State. And I too would like to acknowledge the exceptional leadership of our co-chairs, Harris and Zagos, the active and informed participation of the members of the council, and the tremendous amount of time and effort that the co-chairs, the council members, and the staff have put into this plan. As a leader of the state's primary economic development agency, I'm pleased that the scoping plan recognizes that economic development and the decarbonization of our economy go hand in hand. This plan builds on the work that we are already doing while challenging us to do much more. The plan is sensitive to the needs of our existing industries and for industry, the plan recommends an incentive based approach. We will continue to operate capital access programs and provide support to our businesses to adapt as the state implements this plan. Empire State Development through programs like Green Excelsior is already working to ensure that the technologies we need to fight climate change are built right here in New York, creating jobs and business opportunities that are accessible to all New Yorkers. As ESD stands up the, new, uh, the state's new Office of Strategic Workforce Development, the clean energy job opportunities recognized in the plan will help to further guide our job training efforts. And we're working to align our economic development incentives with a low greenhouse gas future. Our green chips program is setting a nation leading goal standard for economic development that prioritizes good jobs and a clean environment. We look forward to working with our sister agencies and the private sector to implement this plan, reducing greenhouse gases, creating and keeping good jobs in New York, building out the workforce we need for the jobs of the future, and doing all of this in a way that ensures equity, particularly for those in disadvantaged communities. The scoping plan is a guidebook for creating a strong economy and a healthy environment, and I am proud of the work you've done to produce this important document. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Commissioner Reardon. Thank you. I am so honored to be surrounded by colleagues who have taken the time to craft a thoughtful framework to ensure New York State achieves critical benchmarks in our efforts to address climate change. We have traveled statewide and gone to great lengths to truly understand the concerns of different communities and stakeholders on this issue. This council has asked the hard questions, vigorously debated and consulted with experts. We have delved into every page and detail of this plan that we're voting on today. No aspect of this work was easy, but in my view, it was certainly fulfilling and necessary. I'd like to acknowledge Governor Kathy Hochul, who continues to take actions that put New York State on the path to achieving its bold climate agenda and a move toward a more environmentally friendly future. I would like to personally thank and applaud our council co-chairs, NYSERDA President and CEO Doreen Harris and DEC Commissioner Basil Sagos 
What this council has accomplished is the direct result of your wisdom and dedication. The importance and impact of your leadership cannot be overstated. As a co-chair of the Just Transition Working Group, I want to add a special word of thanks to co-chair Harris. It was a pleasure collaborating with you and the entire working group to make sure our strategies encourage and uphold the principles of a truly just transition. I would also like to give special recognition to my good friend, New York State AFL-CIO President Mario Salento. Mario was a late addition to the council, but he has gone above and beyond to advocate for issues that are important to New Yorkers and ensure that labor has a seat at the table. The council has certainly made it a priority to ensure that unions, environmentalists, and other stakeholders have a voice on these matters. I commend my fellow council members for ensuring that this process was open and inclusive. I'd also like to thank the various agency staff that supported and guided our work. They are all consummate professionals. We owe them a debt of gratitude for keeping us on track and focused throughout this transparent process. We know we were an active and challenging group. A sincere thank you to my own staff at the DOL. Balancing the demands of this work with their other responsibilities over the past two years has never been easy, but we know what's at stake. The day-to-day -day challenges were well worth the outcome of reaching this important milestone. Now, this transition will not be instant, but it will be permanent, which is why we were so meticulous in examining details from every angle, because this is such an important chapter in New York State history. This transition is as revolutionary as when electricity was first harnessed. It will completely change our lives while also protecting our precious planet. We must now make good on the aspirations and strategies laid out in this plan. The DOL will continue to support the green workforce of the future. We will support disadvantaged communities who will be lifted up in the green economy and of course the business community at large. As we mark this day together, we signal to the world that New York State is putting words into action. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Ann Reynolds. Thank you. So much has been said, so I appreciate the opportunity to share some reflections about this process, and I have four reflections that I'd like to make. First, uh, this has been an impressive process, as everyone has said, with dozens of meetings and groups and subgroups and public hearings and 30 meetings of this council, all fueled by an army of state employees and consulting experts. This process has looked this way because of the law's requirements, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Our attention to transparency and to process, to disadvantaged communities, to adjust transition, to trade exposed industries, was all directed by the law. And so today, the advocates for this law, primarily the New York Renews Coalition, deserve credit and kudos for their vision and tenacity, as do, as was mentioned, Assemblymember Engelbright and Senator Kaminsky, the bill sponsors, and the legislature as a whole for creating this law. Because without its structure, this process would have looked different or would not have existed at all. Second, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that the technical advisory panels for agriculture, electricity buildings, et cetera, held dozens of meetings, came up with dozens of actions for New York State to pursue. And when these panels reported back to the council, we did not pick and choose from that list and throw some ideas out. But all of those recommendations were put into the mix, included in the modeling of the integration analysis. And the result was that it wasn't enough or it wasn't fast enough. And that is with the greenhouse gas accounting system required by the law, the modeling predicted we would not meet the emissions reduction goals in time. The state team then went back to the drawing board, changed the scale and accelerated the timelines of many actions and reached a point where we did meet the goals on time. But since this happened 18 months ago, I thought it was worth reminding ourselves collectively of that history because it underscores how much we have to do and how fast we need to do it. It's a good reminder that we accepted all of the actions that were recommended, and this includes an economy-wide price signal. I have mentioned it before, but I believe the inclusion of a cap and invest policy lends this plan credibility because it answers two key questions that anyone would ask. 
how are you sure we're going to meet these emission goals? And the answer is because we're going to cap them in regulation and reduce that cap over time. And how will you pay for it? And the answer is that we're going to maximize what we can from the super fantastic Inflation Reduction Act and the federal resources, but we're also going to require the polluters to pay and contribute to the cost of the state meeting this plan. And I think that we need to have a solid answer to those two questions to give this plan credibility. The third thing I want to mention is that although we have 28 years to fully implement the plan, some actions need to start yesterday. And the most fundamental of these is to build renewable electricity projects like solar and wind projects and update and reinvest in our transmission grid. To address all the reliability issues that Gavin mentioned and that were mentioned by others and to deliver that clean power from these projects to where it's needed. So this is fundamental to reaching the near term requirement in the law of 70% renewable power by 2030. And as Tom mentioned, I think focusing on those near term uh, milestones is so important. Um, as a council, we've spent considerably more minutes talking about that last 10% of power that we need that may require some alternative fuels or technologies that aren't commercialized yet than the time we have spent discussing 90% of the solution, which is getting wind and solar and transmission projects under construction. And I understand that was because that last percentage is controversial and we needed to talk about it. Um, but I do worry that if we don't have our eye on how to overcome the near term barriers to getting projects to reach construction, we won't make it to our first milestone of 70 by 30. We really and truly need to turn our climate goals into construction goals, starting with electricity production and the grid. And fourth, and lastly, I want to address the naysayers. There will always be naysayers. I was impressed by the level of support that the draft plan received in the public hearings. We all heard that even the folks who expressed concerns, including very valid questions and worries about the impact to their business, their lifestyle or their pocketbook. Even those folks almost across the board articulated support for climate action and for clean energy and for reinvestment in New York communities. It was really heartening. And in this plan, we have answered many of the concerns at the societal level. That is, we've done a cost benefit analysis and we found that the cost of an action is higher than the cost of action. We found that more jobs will be created than are displaced. But we all know that as New York State implements this plan, these same questions must be answered at the community and at the individual level. And I'm voting yes for this plan because I think that they will be. I think the plan addresses these concerns. Whatever incentives, rebates, carbon pricing policy, all of this need to be designed to protect the vulnerable, whether that be low income New Yorkers, people in frontline communities, workers that could lose their jobs or businesses that won't be able to compete. The plan continually reiterates these concerns as it should. And as we go forward and design all the specific policies to make this happen, we need to continue to keep all of those vulnerable populations in mind. And the final naysaying message is this. Even if New York State implements this plan, we can't stop climate change unless the rest of the world follows. You will see this specific message somewhere in the press in the coming week expressed about this plan. My best guess is it will be a guest essay in the Wall Street Journal, but you can see if I'm wrong. We can even guess who will write it. But what's the logical conclusion to this line of argument? Simply do nothing. Don't act. Let climate change happen. Personally, I think that's both amoral and short-sighted, but it doesn't really matter what I think because New York's legislature has already responded and we are going to act. The other more logical conclusion to that line of argument is to design a plan of action that not only reduces emissions, but that brings lots of other benefits. And that's what we've been talking about for the last three years. Uh, new industries like offshore wind, cleaner air, better and stronger communities, new opportunities for farmers like agrivoltaics, reforestation of our state, a stronger grid, reducing and better managing waste and providing the most energy efficient, efficient industries and buildings that are healthier and more comfortable, 
creating towns with better bus and train and subway service. And that reinvests in places that need it the most and does the really, as we've learned, tough work to define what those communities are that need it the most. So I'm really proud and happy that this is the way New York has gone, not towards resignment and inaction, but to real actions that will also make our state a better place to live. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anne. Secretary Rodriguez. Great, thank you. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here to vote in support of the, the scoping plan. And I want to thank um, our council co-chairs, President Harris and Commissioner Sagos for all the work that they've done to usher us to this point. And I think it's uh, important to recognize the hard work, of course, of Sarah Osgood and Maureen Letty, uh, who've uh, worked tirelessly for many years on this process, but also to recognize my staff at the Department of State, Keisha Santiago, Sarah Crow, Paul Beyer, Jordan Coster, and Josh Hun, who have worked on this four years as well. Um, the honor has been to work alongside all of you uh, in this effort to meet Governor Hochul's ambitious goals for decarbonization and the state's commitment to doing it in the most equitable and sustainable way. Um, and process matters. And I think what we've demonstrated in this process is that we have been able to bring together diverse stakeholders on the various advisory panels, the Climate Justice Working Group, the Just Transition Working Group, and all of those who have volunteered so much time and energy to making sure that their work is incorporated in this plan. I want to particularly thank the members of the Land Use and the Local Government Advisory Panel and the work done by Sarah Kroll to make sure that um, 20 municipal, municipal leaders from all of the regions of the state uh, were able to contribute their expertise to the advisory panel's deliberation. But most importantly, a special thank thanks to the members of the Climate Justice Working Group who helped define disadvantaged communities for us and kept us uh, on a path towards true socioeconomic equity and climate justice. And thank you to the 35,000 members of the public who contributed their comments uh, to make sure that this process was in fact collaborative, broad based and participatory. Because I do believe that this document and this process can serve as a model for local governments, other states, and potentially other nations. And while we've already experienced in New York State the impacts of climate change, and many of our agencies have begun the work to continue to build on it, the recommendations in this scoping plan build on the good work and the lessons and present an ambitious, realistic, um, and visionary move forward. But just to return to the thing that has impressed me most, which is the council's passionate and shared commitment towards the socioeconomic and environmental equity that must be a part of this plan. In East Harlem, the community that I was born and raised in, grew up and represented in the state assembly for 11 years. Um, a no previous proud moment was being able to vote for this legislation, to being able to participate in this process. And another step, it really is truly emblematic of where inequity exists and how too many communities face um, the, the climate crisis head on, both under-resourced uh, and overburdened. But it's my belief that with this plan, we will begin to turn the tide for communities that are both under-resourced and overburdened. The work that we do here now um, strengthens New York's present and future and builds on our legacy of addressing difficult challenges head on. So as the leader of the Department of State, our commitment to community-based planning, supporting local governments, and incorporating smart growth principles uh, in economic development and regional growth are incorporated here in the scoping plan. So it really is a pro uh, an honor to uh, lead the department to make sure that our Department of State embraces clean energy and greenhouse gas reduction as part of our um, initiatives, particularly around downtown, downtown vibrancy, sustainability, and resiliency, especially with our marquee um, programs, including the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, New York Forward, and Smart Growth. We remain committed to supporting our local governments as they develop comprehensive plans and zoning amendments that support clean energy and create exciting downtowns to attract supply chain growth anticipated as part of the energy transition. The smart growth movement was founded on inclusion and integration of the three E's of land use, economic equity and environment. Along the way, we've added a fourth energy uh, and as a result, had to forge a strong, productive partnership with NYSERDA to support green, 
carbon neutral net zero projects in all of our DRI projects and New York forward communities. So this has uh, resulted in establishing a formal interagency partnership um, with NIPA called Drive New York, whereby NIPA provides priority state of the art electric vehicle fast charging stations in DRI communities. We are truly embracing how we can bring together all the ele ele uh, elements of smart growth with our partner agencies. But I would say most importantly is the upcoming challenges regarding building and energy code programs and the state fire prevention and building code council. For example, both will play a critical role in the climate change equation and our team at the Department of State stands ready to, to take up the challenge of moving our state's energy code as quickly as possible towards achieving the goals identified by the Climate Action Council. I'd like to recognize their current and ongoing work in developing a world-class energy code that embraces many of the principles embodied in this plan today. So, as many as have mentioned, I am the parent of two wonderful children and most of the work that we do here is for the next generation and for our children. So I am grateful for the opportunity to move swiftly with this council uh, and recognize that along the way, this plan is not an end as it has been mentioned, but a guidebook for a new beginning a more aggressive, equitable, and comprehensive approach to reaching our ambitious climate goals. I'm proud to vote and approve this ground, uh, groundbreaking and scoping plan and look forward to working with each and every one of you in its implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Raya Salter. Yes, my name is Raya Salter, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center. I was appointed to this council by Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins. I want to thank the majority leader, the co-chairs of this council, the executive director of this council, and all of the state officials who led the development of this plan. The true credit for this plan belongs to the thousands of activists across New York who have rallied, marched, wrote letters and demanded that this be the people's plan. In 2019, I stood with activists not far from where we sit now, who shut down then Governor Cuomo's office in an action to demand the passage of what ultimately became the CLCPA. And it's this law, that law, that required this process and this plan. Together, we have witnessed an extraordinary advocacy arc that has transformed not only New York's climate landscape, but impacted the nation towards climate justice. Here, of course, I refer to the CLCPA's mandate that a goal of 40% of climate investments in no less than 35 must benefit disadvantaged communities. This was the state precedent for what ultimately became the Biden administration's Justice 40 policy. And New York's national leadership continues to this very day. This plan is the product of a participatory process that engaged a wide range of stakeholders. The release of this final scoping plan is a landmark moment for climate action in New York State. The plan, if implemented, will guide New York towards a just energy transition and away from fossil fuels. I was a member of the Council's Gas Transition Subgroup and worked on the scoping plan's vision to retire fossil fuel plants and decarbonize the building sector. It includes a blueprint for the retirement of New York City's most polluting fossil fuel plants and their sites by 2030 that will inform broader planning to retire fossil fuel plants throughout the state. This is a win for environmental justice. The plan's framework for New York's gas system transition will adhere to the state's emissions targets, prioritize affordability, health, and frontline communities while ensuring a just transition for the gas industry workforce. The plan includes a new office of just transition and an accompanying worker support and assurance fund. This will provide the needed state architecture for a just transition. So of course the plan is not perfect, Ideas for market-based cap and invest in biofuel schemes should be rejected if they can't overcome design flaws and stakeholder concerns. While the state's climate law should ultimately prohibit the use of most alternative fuels like renewable natural gas and hydrogen for use in pipelines on an emissions accounting basis, the plan is wrong to comp comp contemplate 
these false solutions. Likewise, looks into so-called advanced nuclear are a dangerous distraction. False solutions will keep New Yorkers paying ever more money for dirty and polluting energy. Right now, New Yorkers pay some of the highest energy costs in the nation, including widely and wildly fluctuating costs for fossil gas in particular, and this must change. The scoping plan, however, provides a comprehensive approach to reaching the state's nation leading climate goals with a focus on justice and equity. The next step is to see it fully implemented. We will all need to work together to make this happen. I'm pretty confident that activists will continue to demand just climate action, that we equitably fund the work that needs to be done, that we stick to the pace and measures set by our climate law and keep a true north of climate justice. We will need to see the agency rules developed pursuant to the plan and the climate law and progress in all areas. The mandates to benefit dis disadvantaged communities must go forward. The subsidy engagement of indigenous communities must make more progress. We will keep saying no to false solutions. Advocates like myself intend to hold the state to its word. But for all of the above reasons, I voted yes to approve the final New York State Climate Action Council scoping plan. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. Dr. Shepson. Thank you. Well, I'll start by noting and asking us to remember that people around the world have not been paying the actual costs of burning fossil fuels to meet our energy needs. And so it is exciting and just and honorable that we are now embarking on a better way with far fewer collateral costs to the environment in support of all living things on the planet. And so I enthusiastically endorse the December 19, 2022 final version of the New York State Climate Action Council scoping plan. While the scoping plan incorporates multiple compromises in wording and orientation, given the diverse and sometimes divergent interests of components of the CAC membership, it is nonetheless a great statement of New York State's commitment to national and global leadership in the effort to achieve climate stabilization. The scoping plan, which supports the implementation of the CLCPA, is a document of which I am proud and feel fortunate to have been able to contribute to its completion. I'm impressed by and grateful for the hard work and dedication of the agency staff members who worked hard to bring this effort to completion and the fantastic leadership of our co-chairs, Doreen and Basil and of Sarah Osgood. I want to thank my fellow CAC members for helping to make this process enjoyable and successful. In closing, I want to note that I have spent the bulk of my career working hard so that I might someday have the opportunity to return to New York. And as it turns out, to a great SUNY flagship institution, Stony Brook University, thank you, Dennis, for reminding me regularly of my good fortune. I'm very proud of the New York that I came home to. Last, I will say that I've been also very proud to be represented by Assemblyman Steve Engelbright, a true leader for New York, and proud to help him in some small ways in realizing his vision for New York State. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Commissioner Visnauskas. Hi. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Ruth Amosnauskas, and I'm the Commissioner of New York State Homes and Community Renewal. I think I'm the last person to give a comment today. When your last name is Visnauskas, you're often called last. Uh, but I like to just think of myself as sort of the closer for what's really been an incredible 
set of comments, not the last one. Uh, thank you to uh, Basil and Doreen. It is not easy to manage a really complex process like this uh, alongside your day job. And I thank you for your commitment and your leadership uh, and your partnership. It's really been an incredible process. Uh, I would also thank Governor Hochul for her commitment in supporting this entire uh, effort. Over the past two years, it's been my honor to sit on the Climate Action Council and to co-chair the Energy Efficiency and Housing Advisory Panel. When we first started, I think transportation was thought to be the primary emitter. Uh, and while it wasn't a race I was trying to win, I was certainly happy to lead this effort given its incredible importance. The work that we did on the Housing and Buildings Panel was thoughtful and impactful and critical to the process. I want to thank the 14 panel members for the work that they have done on behalf of New York State. They really gave their time and their expertise, uh, and I'm appreciative of that. I would also thank uh, what was for me the world's best co-chair in Janet Joseph, who has since retired from NYSERDA, but was really an incredible partner. Today, I'm proud to approve the recommendations we put forth as required by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. What we recommended will have long lasting beneficial impacts on the buildings we work in and live in and their effect on our environment and climate change. This has been an exhaustive process. Not exhaustive as in tiring, though I do think that the number of collective hours would probably exhaust anyone, but exhaustive as in fully comprehensive and also a very thoughtful and very inclusive process. I'm very proud to be part of it, and I thank all the staff who we depended on to carry us to, carry us to this critical point. As Basil said in his remarks, and Peter as well, and, and, and uh, Robert, I'm, as I'm sure many of you do, I often think of my three children when I think about this work. Theirs will be the first generation to test whether we have stretched enough in our goals to create sustainable solutions or if we fell a little bit short. A year ago, we voted as members of the Climate Advisory Council to release for public review and public comment the draft of the scoping plan that we had all crafted. Among the more than 1,000 comments recorded were important reminders that at the same time that we're creating and preserving affordable housing, we must ensure that workforce transitions are empowering for people, that education is keeping pace with changes in the marketplace, and that training remains top of mind. We must achieve our aims without harming people's livelihoods, vulnerable communities, or the economy. And our challenge is to keep the building industry moving forward and flourishing while we preserve and create housing in a more environmentally conscious way. To be certain, we did make changes to the plan that reflect people's most fundamental concerns, including the need to create good family sustaining jobs where possible and seeking to balance job development and the goal of delivering on our carbon reduction goals. I believe the public process we did was central to the entire CAC endeavor. And while we were deep in the weeds creating the document and focused on the program of deep decarbonization, the world has also woken up to the threat of climate change. For sure, at my agency, Homes and Community Renewal, we have shifted. We have implemented changes inspired by this process. Just this year, we released new mandatory climate neutral design guidelines for affordable housing developments that we finance across the state. Next month, we're gonna formally launch a $250 million climate friendly homes fund. This will uh, finance 10,000 climate friendly electrified or electrification ready homes by 2030. And we're partnering with NYSERDA on a clean energy initiative that helps streamline both financial and technical assistance from New York State for highly efficient all electric new construction and adaptive reuse projects. And I'm proud to say there's more to come. There's over seven and a half million housing units in the state of New York, and we keep building. So we have our work cut out for us. But building green and building carbon neutral and building sustainable is becoming the norm. And although change is hard, doing anything other than that is simply impossible. So for all New Yorkers, our, all of our collective children and their children and beyond, I support this plan. Thank you, everyone, and happy holidays. Yes. Thank you all for those uh, statements, and um, we will be posting your written statements on the Climate Act um, website as well. So um, we have a, a few concluding um, items here. First, I'll ask Sarah to review a few next steps um, as we conclude this process, and then I will, uh, with my co-chair, advance some acknowledgments um, for the participants in this process. So Sarah? Thank you, Doreen. If we could go to the next slide, please. 
Um, so a, a press release announcing the finalization of the scoping plan by the Climate Action Council will be sent out this afternoon by DEC and NYSERDA. Uh, the release will also include a link to the executive summary um, and the full scoping plan that's on the website. Also just want to make note um, for folks that, um, that may have noticed the, the Climate Act website, climate.ny.gov, has been revamped uh, over the weekend and updated today with additional content and information, including resources for stakeholders, the media, the general public. Um, this includes several fact sheets and infographics on various sectors of the plan. Um, and our communications teams will be reaching out to the media and stakeholders to make them aware of the plan, provide additional information and resources, help answer any questions. Um, and with that, I would just say uh, we look forward to ongoing collaboration and efforts as, as part of this process and hope everyone has a happy, healthy, and safe holiday season and new year. Thank you. Back to you, Dorian and Basil. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next slide, please. So during all of our remarks, um, everyone acknowledged the staff. Uh, these slides, these two slides, if you can see them, God bless you, uh, is are the 300 staff that have been working on this plan for nearly three years. So we put that up there as a visual uh, so you understand just how much time and effort and passion has gone into this. Let's give them all a big round of applause more time. Yes, I will share um, my observation that these are truly dedicated, hardworking, and committed individuals who have been working um, tirelessly to get us to this point. And it's been amazing to the points made um, by several that this has really brought agencies together in a way that I personally and I know my co-chair and I share the view that we can continue to build on this um, momentum together. And we've also been supported by a number of, of consultants in this process, and I want to acknowledge CADMUS, Consensus Build Building Institute, E3, and Arch Street Communications as well. So um, certainly so many to thank. And I, I really need uh, to pause here, though, to thank our Executive Director, Sarah Osgood. Sarah, there's a gift somewhere for you. I don't know where it went, but hopefully someone can appear with it now because, uh, oh, there we go. Is it a new There we car? go. We were hiding it from you so well that I can't find it. Um, <laughs> just a little something um, for you. But Sarah, seriously, um, you couldn't have joined this process at a better time and we could not have made this progress without you. And so I want you to have a happy, safe holiday season and new year, because you certainly deserve it so much. And I believe we have another acknowledgement. Uh, from my co we do. Next slide, please. So 15 years ago, a young man walked into DEC. 15 years later, a young man is walking out of DEC. Uh, that's Jared Snyder, De uh, Deputy Commissioner for Climate, Air, and Energy, who has been biding his time, toiling away for 15 years uh, to get to this very moment where he can drop the mic and walk off into the sunset uh, into a great retirement. And to say that Jared is, has been a force on climate, clean air, and energy would be an understatement. He's a state leader on this. He's a national leader on this. At his retirement kickoff uh, just this week, he had folks flying up from Washington, D.C., from the Georgetown uh, Energy Center, Climate Center, uh, to acknowledge Jared's contributions nationally to uh, so many things. So, Jared, thank you. Uh, we wish you well, and we know you, we will have some work to do. So if you get the urge, come back and join us. But let's, let's give Jared a huge round. Jared, please stand up. Stand up.
And finally, um, we certainly have noted the strong leadership of our governor in advancing this process. And I want you to know that in recognition of the contributions, we can turn to the next slide, of the members of the council toward the achievement of the Climate Act, Governor Hochul has conferred upon the members a citation, which we will provide to each of the members. And we will now read the citation, which reflects the governor's recognition and thanks to each of you for your contributions to this process. It reads, whereas New York State has a long and respected history as a trailblazer in promoting environmental progress, clean energy initiatives, and climate leadership, and whereas the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act of 2019 established the Climate Action Council and directed this body to develop and issue a comprehensive scope, uh, climate scoping plan by the end of 2022 in order to achieve emission reductions across the economy and a just and equitable transition. And whereas the spirit of the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act called for both process and substance rooted in climate justice for New York State's historically underserved communities. And the council has worked diligently, diligently and conscientiously to meet this imperative in its actions and its words, including through the careful consideration of the impact of the scoping plan and engagement with the Climate Justice Working Group. And whereas in recognition of the crucial role that New York workers and labor unions have in successfully meeting the objectives of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the Climate Action Council strengthened its final scoping plan to ensure the priorities of workers, both existing and new, are at the center of the state's roadmap for a just transition. And whereas the members of the Climate Action Council individually and collectively possess and exhibit profound expertise and experience in the matters of clean energy, emissions reduction, climate resilience, climate justice, workforce and economic opportunities, energy equity and beyond, and whereas the development and finalization of the scoping plan required immense effort on the part of all members of the Climate Action Council and their respective staff teams, Members of the council met a total of 31 times over the past three years to complete this intensive process and produce a final scoping plan of the utmost quality, depth, and insight. And getting there. Whereas the council members work together in an exceptional, exceptional display of collaboration, constructively and respectfully listening to differing perspectives, engaging in a robust exchange of ideas and rigorous debate rooted in science analysis and facts, providing a model for democratic deliberation and further demonstrating New York's global leadership. And whereas the Climate Action Council carried out its mission with the highest level of transparency and public engagement, converting seamlessly to virtual and hybrid meetings during the pandemic, taking in over 300, 35,000 written public comments and hosting 11 public hearings to ensure its work reflected the voice of New Yorkers across the state. And whereas the contributions of the Climate Action Council represent an extraordinarily important public service to all people of New York, which will deliver real and lasting benefits to communities across every corner of the state for generations to come. And now, Therefore, I, Kathy Hochul, governor of the state of New York, do hereby confer this special citation upon, insert your name, in recognition of your significant contributions to the development of the scoping plan and the overall achievement of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, and for your abiding personal commitment to the betterment of New York State residents, businesses, and communities today and in the future. Congratulations to you all. So we'll still so have the citations for each of you and we are told that they would like a photo of this council before we close out this process. Thank you. That's it. Photo on the stage. 2020. You mean in, in no meeting next week? 